on, take the bloody bag off his head. Fresh start. Introductions. Ajay Gale, our guest of honor. Little monkey, whose name I still don't know. And I, of course, am Pagan Min. There are some very disreputable people around. Those fucking terrorists, they ruin everything. Look to my example and see it as the positive influence it is. Then they say I've lost touch with my subjects. I'm with Ajay Gale. Help. We're here in a dark basement somewhere in Paris playing Far Cry 4. And we've managed to snag a couple of minutes with Lucien Solbon, uh, one of the writers on Far Cry 4, to talk about uh, the story. Uh, so tell me, who is AJ? AJ Gale is somebody that was born into the country of Karat, where the setting of the game is, but he wasn't raised there. He was raised in the United States with his mother, and he never knew about this connection in Karat. Now, he comes back to the country thinking he's bringing his mother's ashes there, but he finds out that there is a huge backstory be between him, between the country, uh, everything about who he is is tied up in Karat itself. And he starts discovering that, and the player discovers that with him. Right. And um, during our conversation before, you mentioned that uh, that his last name can be pronounced differently, and that, that's uh, that's a deliberate action. Why well, is that? That's a deliberate thing, because I mean, the thing is, is that he was raised in the United States, so he calls himself A.J. Gale just simply because it was an easier thing to explain to people, more a way of sort of acclimatizing himself and hiding in uh, the United States. But over here in Karat, they call him A.J. Gale. And so we wanted that difference to show somebody who's an outsider, who's, uh, who's an outsider and who has a diff uh, calls himself something different, but he actually, his real name is more rooted in the traditions of uh, Karat. Right. And we noticed as well that, that um, he seems to have a personal relationship, or at least a personal history with the antagonist, uh, uh, Pagan Mi. Uh, yeah, Pagan Min, yeah. sorry. Uh, can, you, can you go in, into any detail about that? Well, that's one of the mysteries that we wanted to set up. Uh, normally, whenever you have the villain being introduced, it's uh, under threat. It's, you know, I'm going to kill you. I'm out to hurt you. We wanted Pagan Min to have a personal relationship with A.J. Gale. And we wanted the player to realize that and to realize that this guy just wasn't out to kill him. Now, what that specific relationship is, that's going to be something that you'll uncover in the story. But yes, there is a personal relationship there. And I th we think it makes the dynamic a lot more interesting. Right. We get the feeling as well that, that he doesn't really look at himself as an antagonist. He doesn't... Um, is, is he a mis misunderstood good guy or, or just a misguided uh, uh, hero, sort of, in his own world? Well, in, in, you know, that's really interesting because in a lot of ways he, he might almost see himself as such, but I think Pagan Min is kind of above the description of hero and villain. He's a king of this country. He's here to re uh, lead the people out from whatever lives they've had before and try to bring them into the modern world. So as far as he's concerned, there's a reason he calls himself king. You don't put yourself on like the money of this country and not think of yourself as part of the savior or part of the solution to help these people. So maybe he doesn't see himself exactly as the hero, but he sees himself as necessary for what Karat needs. Right. Um, we've been looking a little bit at the uh, co-op mode, and uh, can you tell us a little bit who is Herc? And Herc, Herc is, uh, honestly, I love Herc. Herc uh, is, is a really fun character to write. Uh, Herc is uh, a, a transplant, one of the legacy characters from Far Cry 3 that made it over here. And Herc is just this kind of genuine good guy. He's like easygoing, he's a goof. But you kind of wonder what it takes for somebody to go vacationing in a war-torn country. But, you know, Herc is the kind of person that makes that work. So for us, actually, Herc is also really important because in the co-op, you play AJ, right, throughout the entire game, and you're discovering your own backstory through events. Herc is almost like that as well in terms of he knows very little about the country that he's in. He just shows up and he starts doing things. He has his own little quest line. He has his own agenda. But for the most part, he's here discovering the world at the same time that you are. So he's the perfect buddy character. Especially since Herc is easygoing and you don't really need description of who he is. The minute you see the guy, you're like, I know who he is. Right. Uh, now, Mark Thompson uh, stated that, that you uh, went, uh, you set out to fix some of the, some of the issues that were um, present in the, in the story of, of Far Cry uh, 3, especially when it comes to the pacing of the story. Um, how, how do you go about doing that without destroying either the sense of freedom or, or the pacing uh, in, in, the, in the plot? 
Well, that's the thing. I think what we ended up by doing was actually embracing the freedom even more. We shifted, we shifted over from having a story that was driven about the character, which means that the player is almost a chauffeur for all the actions that the, that the, uh, that the character needs to do. And we shifted it over to say, no, this is no longer about the character's story, this is the player's story. So what happens is the pacing is still there in terms of you have these missions, uh, you know, you're helping along the way, but what happens is we put relevance on the open world to where you can do the open world missions and you can also do the open, uh, you can do the uh, missions, you can do the open world stuff, and they still have relevance together. So what we wanted to make sure of is that at no point are you stepping out of the story. At no point are you doing something that you're like, my buddies are kidnapped. Wow. Oh, look, tiger. You know, you're not doing any of that. So everything is sort of interwoven. Uh, and that really helps with the pacing because at no point do you feel you're not anywhere you're supposed to be. Right. Um, one thing that you got a, a bit of criticism for was the, the obvious um, connections between the setting and the country of Nepal and, and cultures around the area. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the difficulties of creating a fictional country in a real world location, sort of? Right. Well, you know, the really funny thing about it is that, you know, we created a fictional country to avoid, you know, insulting a culture, insulting a people. I mean, even within the game, we've had a lot of discussions. You know, we'll, we'll be writing something and somebody will come up to us and say, hey, do you realize that this term or this action may be offensive to a certain group or may be offensive to the region? And we looked at it and go, oh. You know what, you're right after researching it, and you know, we'll remove it from the game. What happens is we made Karat fictional for the, to, to avoid any sort of problems because we wanted to offer the freedom of a location, we wanted to create the new mythology, we wanted to do all those sorts of things. So the difficult part about it is, you know, as you've mentioned before, are people perceiving that this is Nepal, when in fact it's an amalgamation of all the countries around the Himalayas, and even the Himalayas themselves. Even the Himalayas themselves carry a sort of mythology with them. And we wanted to bring all of that together, the Hindi culture, the Nepalese culture, Tibetan, Himalayas, all of that. So the, 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 true, the true difficulty is kind of in, in interweaving everything together, making sure that it all makes sense and it kind of resonates with the setting. So you mentioned the, uh, the mythology of the Himalayas. Um, uh, tell us about uh, Shangri-La, how it connects to that. Well, one of the things that we wanted to do was, uh, it, instead of just leaving a whole bunch of things around for you to read and you hear about the culture uh, through like third-person accounts, we wanted you to experience part of the mythology of Shangri-La. Initially, we took a look at it and we were like, okay, what do we want Shangri-La to be? But the, the minute we realized that it could be an exploration of the mythology that you keep on hearing about and you see the giant statues and you're like, I don't know who this person is, but now you can actually find out who this person is and you can play in Shangri-La, in the mythology, and you can understand more about the culture through that experience. Uh, so, so how does that uh, influence gameplay? Oh, well, what we have in Shangri-La is it actually uh, brings about new skills that you can uh, use in the game. So it actually adds to your real world experience as well. So it's, it also broadens the gameplay, it gives you uh, new levels to look at, new art, and everything. It's, uh, in some ways it's almost like a, a change of pace as you're playing through it, uh, but it doesn't take you out of the experience of uh, the main storyline. Right. Well, uh, I have no, no further questions, but the game looks absolutely stunning. Uh, Thank you very much, and we're really happy. We found a basement that had all this Far Cry 4 decor. It was we had to use it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Thank you. Oh, would you hold this? For just a moment, I want to get a little picture right into the camera. There we are. Awesome. Mm. Don't worry about a thing, my boy. This will soon be behind us and we'll be off on a grand adventure. Because I have cleared my calendar for you. You and I are gonna tear shit up! Should I stay or should I go?